Hey guys, welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. And today I want to talk about five atheist double standards. Now, I bring this up not to pick on atheists, but to raise the level of discourse. In fact, there are a lot of atheists online, people like the Real Atheology Crew, uh, Majesty of Reason, people who want to raise the level of discourse. Well, Real Atheology or Atheist, Majesty of Reason is more agnostic. But my point is that they also call out double standards. I've really seen other people, like Scott Clifton, for example, he'll call out other atheists. I love it also when I see atheists online that I enjoy interacting with, when they call out other atheists for engaging in uh, arguments that have logical fallacies or for using double standards, the atheists they call out will say, you're just a Christian, you believe in a magical sky daddy, and they'll say, dude, I'm an atheist too, but I just don't use these bad arguments. And I feel the same way. I find there are Catholics who will use really bad arguments, and I want to say to them, hey, don't use these really bad arguments. We should put forward the best arguments on either side so that we can all raise a level of discourse. That would be a good thing to do, right? So that's just what I want to talk about today. Five atheist double standards. I'm not saying every atheist does this. In fact, there are atheists I know who would say, yeah, definitely don't do these things. So let's start with the first one. Number one is the ancient document double standard. This is the idea that the Bible is treated as guilty until proven innocent, that the Bible is just different than any other kind of ancient literature. For example, if someone says, well, how do you know Jesus did this or that? To say, well, the Bible says, oh, the Bible, the Bible says, they'll say things like, you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible. Now, in a sense, that's true. Like, you can't just use the Bible as a human document to say the Bible says God exists, the Bible is the Word of God, therefore God exists, or the Bible says it's the Word of God, therefore it's the Word of God. Right? That's a circular argument. You can't do that. So I see where they're coming from. If they mean you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible in a circular argument, yeah, they're right. But to say you can't use the Bible even to prove mundane historical facts, like that Jesus existed, Jesus called 12 disciples. He had a reputation for being a faith healer in Jerusalem, in Galilee. He was crucified. People claimed to have seen Jesus after his crucifixion. And that's what's funny, is people say to me, well, prove that Jesus rose from the dead without using the Bible. And I would say, well, why do I have to do that? Why? The Bible, quotation marks, is a collection of ancient documents. If I'm going to prove anything about Jesus or the origins of Christianity, shouldn't I use the documents that were written by those people? It doesn't mean I believe them. Like, when I converted to Christianity, it's not because I read the Bible and said, oh, Jesus rose from the dead, because the Bible says so. Rather, I looked at the Bible as a set of historical documents, said they could be have true things, might have false things, and sifted through them to find the most basic facts I can pull from them. That'd be Jesus' uh, life, his death by crucifixion, and the followers who claim to see him alive after his death. And so what I would just ask atheists is, look, treat the Bible like you treat any other ancient historical document. Give it a chance. There could be true things, there could be false things in it. What are the standards you will use to determine if something is true or not? One standard that's used that would amount to a double standard is to say, well, I'll believe whatsoever, whatever is in the Bible that is confirmed by another ancient document. It's a kind of corroboration test. So... In order to believe something happened in the Bible, prove it with something else outside of the Bible that confirms it. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe that. But by that logic, if you use Tacitus or Josephus, the ancient Roman and Jewish historian, uh, Tacitus is Roman, Josephus is Jewish, to prove the Bible, then what outside sources confirm Tacitus and Josephus? What outside sources confirm their outside sources? You'd be caught in an infinite regress. And in fact, Pope Leo XIII, at the end of the 19th century, he made this observation related to this double standard. He wrote, A profane book or ancient document is accepted without hesitation, whilst the scripture, if they only find in it a suspicion of error, is set down with the slightest possible discussion as quite untrustworthy. So the Bible is guilty until proven innocent, but other ancient historians are innocent until proven guilty. Now, some people say, well, it's different. The Bible talks about miracles, so it's not trustworthy. But a lot of ancient historians also talk about miracles as well. But you don't throw them out either. Instead, we should go through all of them and see which events, natural and supernatural, 
are most likely to have actually occurred? Are the descriptions of the events mere hearsay? Do they have a, a direct connection to an eyewitness, for example, like Paul, who testified to seeing the risen Jesus and then went and spoke to other people who had seen the risen Jesus as well? People who are willing to die for that belief to show their sincerity of it? So that's what I would say is don't treat the Bible, or to say that someone using the Bible to demonstrate even a, a minimal historical fact about Jesus, uh, don't just write it off as using the Bible to prove the Bible. Treat the Bible like you treat other ancient documents, and just see what are the most basic facts you can take from them. And with the Bible, I would say, well, what explains these basic minimal facts about the origin of Christianity? Why did a bunch of people come to believe that a crucified rabbi uh, had risen from the dead and was God incarnate? Why did they believe that? I think because it happened is a very good explanation for all of those facts. Let me talk about another double standard related to this one. I call it the Spider-Man objection. It goes like this. If, you, if an atheist will sometimes say, well, the Bible's not reliable. Here's all these errors in it. And they'll point out all of these errors. Even the presence of a few errors. Oh, it's not reliable. We can't trust the Bible because it's unreliable. But if you show how reliable the Bible is, like if you walk through the book of Acts and say, well, look, Acts of the Apostles gets a lot of really uh, obscure historical and geographical facts correct, things that only someone in that particular time and place would have known, that helps us to give an early date for it, to talk about authentic authorship related to it. Uh, if you see, look at all of these things that the Bible gets right, what you'll hear is, so what? Spider-Man comics get a lot of things about New York right. It doesn't mean Spider-Man existed. So it's heads I win, tails you lose. If the Bible has errors, it's not true. If the Bible gets a ton of things right, so what? So do Spider-Man comics. There's nothing the Bible can do in order to prove uh, that it's accurate unless it's corroborated by every other ancient document, which is not how ancient sources work. In fact, Josephus and Tacitus, they missed important events. They didn't describe the Emperor Claudius expelling the Jews from Rome in AD 41. That was a huge event. They didn't record it. They missed it. But the Bible got it right. Luke did in Acts chapter 18. So that shows that Pope Leo's observation uh, is still proven today. And of course, the important thing to remember is that we know Spider-Man is fiction because the creators of the comics have told us it's fiction, whereas the New Testament authors assert that this is something that really did happen in history. And Spider-Man's deeds, if they really did happen, would be covered by a bunch of other news sources and things like that. Whereas in the ancient world, there were not as many writers writing about things. And Jesus wasn't flying around Jerusalem like how Spider-Man web slings around New York City. He was a faith healer, an exorcist. His most amazing miracle was rising from the dead. And when he did that, he only appeared to his disciples and to an enemy of the church, Paul. And we have the testimony we would expect if Jesus did appear to those people. All right, here's double standard number two. Saying that God is evil, but then saying there is no such thing as evil. I want to share with you two quotes from Richard Dawkins, the author of The God Delusion. Here's the first quote about the Bible. So Dawkins writes, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. In other words, Richard Dawkins says, the God of the Bible is evil, as if that's a, it's a fact. The God of the Bible is evil. Not just Dawkins' opinion of the matter, because Christians would say, no, he's not evil. He's the greatest thing since sliced bread. He would say, what are you talking about? Just read the things that God has done in the Bible. Clearly, he is evil because he has done things that are objectively evil. Uh, ethnic cleansing, killing of infants, uh, things like that. These things, it's just a fact that they're evil. But then here's another quote from Richard Dawkins. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. So on the one hand, it's just a fact that God is evil because he does evil things. But on the other hand, if these actions take place in the universe, like someone uh, committing genocide or committing infanticide, this isn't evil. If God does not exist and infants are killed or entire races are wiped out, that's just nature. That's just atoms in motion 
Uh, it's nothing but pitiless indifference we see in the universe. No evil, no good. Uh, we live in a materialist universe. So you see here the, the double standard of quickly wanting to say it's a fact that God is evil or, or Christians are evil. But then when we talk about the universe itself, we can't say certain things are objectively good or objectively evil, because then we would ask, well, what is evil? One definition of evil that I like is something is evil when it's not the way it is supposed to be. You can't just say, well, evil is suffering. Okay, well, there can be suffering that's not evil. Like when a de like if you a dentist drills a cavity, that's not evil. It's a good thing he's doing to help me, even though it hurts. And people can commit evil acts without causing suffering. I've asked atheists, is it evil for someone to fantasize about molesting children if he never acts on it? And a lot of them have said, no, it's not evil. They've said, you can't have evil if there's no suffering. And I, I would say... No, most of most people would think those are evil thoughts. So that that's not right. But if evil are just the way things are not supposed to be, and goodness are the way things are supposed to be, that assumes a lot of teleology or a goal or purpose of the universe that makes sense under theism, but not under atheism. Now, some people might say when the problem of evil comes up, they'll say, "Look, this is just an internal critique. I'm just saying that you, as a Christian," You believe in good and evil. You believe in objective good and objective evil. Well, guess what? Under your standards, God is evil. All right? So even under your standards, he's evil, even though I don't believe in good and evil. Now, I think that this option is put forward when the double standard is pointed out, because I don't think Richard Dawkins is saying Christians should believe that God is evil. He's just saying that it is a fact that God is evil. But more problematic is that if this is an internal critique— uh, when atheists propose this, I can come back and say, all right, well, you're saying, you're not saying God is evil, you're just saying my worldview is inconsistent, that if I'm saying these actions are evil and God does them, that would make God evil as well, I could just say, well, when God performs certain actions, it's not evil for God, it's not inconsistent. It might be wrong for me to kill someone because I didn't give them their life. I'm not the author of life like God is, but God created the whole universe. He created everyone, and he has the right to give us as long or as little life as he desires because he is the author of life. And a lot of atheists, when I put forward, they'll say, oh, no, that's still evil. God wouldn't have the right to do something like that. And so at this point, I'll say, even if I make my system internally consistent with the moral rules— You'll just come back and say, well, I reject those moral rules, or I reject that idea God could be the author of life, you know, things like that. So ultimately, I would say they do believe in moral uh, law. Many will believe in objective morality, objective good, objective evil. They'll believe in that when they are offended by something God did in the Bible or something that a Christian has done. And so they'll, they'll, they'll just factually say something is good and something is evil— but then when pressed to define good and evil and explain the source of these objective moral norms, uh, it becomes a lot more problematic. I want to share with you also a quote from Luke, I think his name is Luke Muehlhauser. I don't know if he's written on atheism in a while. He had a really good website called Common Sense Atheism. Uh, I remember reading it long, long time ago, probably like 10 years ago, and wrote a lot on philosophy of religion, apologetics, and he talks about how atheists— uh, ridicule religious people for believing in God because it just seems like God exists, while also believing in moral realism, or the idea that moral truths, uh, you know, that uh, raping people is always evil, like that's just an objective fact, uh, that these moral truths, they just exist out there, they're a part of the universe, and believe that for atheists who believe in moral realism— some of them can be inconsistent or have a double standard in this regard. I'm going to read to you uh, what he wrote. I found this really fascinating. He writes, Many atheists seem to think moral realism is obvious and easy to prove. I disagree. Consider the claim we moral realists are making. We generally claim there are invisible properties in the world not detectable by our usual tools of science, properties of an entirely different sort than the usual is facts of science. There are mysterious ought facts, and there is great disagreement about what they are or how we know them. Now that is a strong claim, an extraordinary claim, we might say, and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? He then goes on to point out the double standard. He says, do those arguments look familiar? They should. 
they are the exact same arguments atheists reject when they are given for the existence of God. Atheists are skeptical of these arguments when given for the existence of God, but they are credulous and gullible towards these arguments when you replace the word God with another mysterious thing called moral truths. It would be hypocritical of me to reject subjective experience and popular consensus as evidence for God, while at the same time accepting subjective experience and popular consensus as evidence for moral realism. All right, here's double standard number three. Bad Christians are evidence against Christianity. Bad atheists don't prove anything. I used to read the Pathios blog, the Atheism Pathios blog, before it became the Atheism Pathios non-religious blog. I would go there and try to find different arguments or reflections, and it was interesting. It was interesting to look at. But I eventually got sick of it, because on a lot of these atheistic blogs, they got really repetitive. Most of the entries were, look at this bad Christian who stole money from his church. Look at this bad Christian who molested people. This bad Christian, that bad Christian. Okay, well, if there's tens of millions of Christians, you're bound to find some that are, that are hypocrites or that have moral failings. But it's really hard to find a hypocritical atheist. The only kind of hip, because what atheists will say, if, you, if I point out a bad atheist, you'll say, well, what about that scandal a few years ago about atheistic conferences having to make the attendees sign statements promising they won't sexually harass the women there? Uh, because that was a really big problem in atheist conferences. I've never had to sign anything like that at a Christian conference, but apparently that was a big problem at atheist conferences a while back. People say, well, that's not hypocrisy, because atheism doesn't say anything about morality. It doesn't say anything about how people will behave. It just says there's no reason to believe God exists. So, yeah, it's, it's hard. I would rather be a Christian who fails in Christian morality than be a non-hypocritical atheist, because atheism doesn't have any particular moral stances. You could be a humanist, you could be a nihilist, there's all different kinds of, of atheists in, in that regard. So I just think that's, you know, it's not very fair to want to point out, here are these bad Christians, obviously that shows that Christianity is bad. Well, there are also bad atheists. Can you make an art? And I wouldn't use that to try to show there's an argument that atheism is bad. Uh, just there's going to be bad people in every kind of belief system. Uh, this also works in the other direction, though, because if atheists say, well, bad atheists don't say anything about atheism, because atheism has nothing to do with particular moralities, then you can't go in the opposite direction and say, look at this brilliant atheistic scientist, or look at this really reasonable atheistic philanthropist. Aren't they great? Aren't they such great examples of reason unchained from religion? It's very subtle that happens, but pointing out very virtuous atheists, if you do that as a way to try to show, oh, look what real atheism can do, I feel like if you do that, e even subtly, you're doing the inverse. You're saying, well, yeah, bad atheists don't prove anything, but look at these great atheists. Look at Carl Sagan. Uh, look at Neil deGrasse Tyson, though I know he's more of an agnostic and people have mixed feelings about him. Uh, so sorry, if the bad atheists don't disprove atheism, the good atheists don't really show anything about the virtues of, of atheism either. That's also why I don't rely on the testimony of the saints as a major proof for Christianity. Rather, I would use those testimonies as an opportunity to ask a question, wow, what really motivated these people to these amazing acts of holiness? And then for us to dig deeper, because there's other, there's other bad Christians as well. Oh, and good and bad Christians. Uh, when there's a really good atheist, people will sometimes say, well, their free thinking is what makes them uh, so good, and they'll tie the virtue into atheism. But if you bring up a really, really good Christian, someone like Martin Luther King Jr., for example, people will say, well, Christianity didn't make them good. They, they would have been good anyways, even if it weren't for religion. And some people even say that they were good in spite of religion. Uh, Christopher Hitchens said about Martin Luther King Jr., in no real, as opposed to nominal sense, then, was he a Christian? So Hitchens denied that Martin Luther King Jr. was a real Christian because he didn't act in the ways that the ancient Israelites acted, for example. But I think clearly, and other atheists will agree with this, that there are people who are very good, who are Christian, who if they had not become Christian, their lives might have been very different in that regard. Now, the only time I'm willing to tolerate something that resembles this double standard 
would be if an atheist argued this way. Look, if Christianity were true, we would expect people to be moved by grace, uh, to be good and not commit uh, grievous uh, sins. But if atheism is true, we would not expect atheists to have any kind of grace or supernatural help to be more moral than other people. So it's okay to point out immoral Christians, but not immoral atheists. So if it is at least phrased this way, okay, I see where you're coming from, all right? Uh, if it's just lazy, like, look at all these awful Christians, ah, ha, 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 and it's just a way of kind of a gotcha moment, well, that, that's lazy thinking. And then that re- leads to the lazy reply when it comes to pointing out bad atheists. So I will say this argument, it's called the meager moral fruits argument. As a Christian, I would offer other reasons then as to why we would, we would expect there to be some really bad Christians, and we wouldn't necessarily expect uh, Christians in given areas to always be more moral than atheists for a variety of reasons. But mere moral fruits argument, an argument for another time. Once again, on both sides, don't focus on the bad elements of each side. What are the best elements, the best people and the best arguments? Let's judge them on their merits. All right, double standards number four and five. Number four, ridiculing Christian censorship, but excommunicating atheistic heretics. So, you recall before that when you point out bad atheists, uh, people will say, oh, well, that even if that atheist was a sex offender or a really bad person, uh, that doesn't disprove atheism because atheism has nothing to do intrinsically with morality. There's atheists with all different kinds of morality. They'll say atheism is just about, it's only about lack of belief in God or that God does not exist. That is what atheism is only about. And they will then sometimes ridicule Christians who in the Middle Ages Uh, you know, excommunicate people, Uh, heretics are exiled, you know, people are treated as heretics, excommunicated, there's no freedom of thought in Christianity, you have to sign dogmatic, like at a college, you have to sign a statement of faith, and if you deviate from that, you'll be fired, you're a heretic, that Christianity has to have thought police to make sure everyone thinks the same way, whereas atheists are free thinkers. But I think that's actually a big double standard, because especially recently, in the past few years, you have cases of atheists imposing secular liberal dogma far beyond the mere claims that there's you know, no evidence for God or something like that. Uh, two examples of this, one would be Stephen Woodford from Rationality Rules. He had a controversy, i say it was a year or two ago, it was a little while ago, where he was denounced by the atheist community of Austin— uh, here in Texas, because Woodford pr- posted videos where he questioned the fairness of transgender women competing with biological women. So biological males who identify as women competing against biological women in athletics, he questioned whether that was fair and gave arguments against that. And against that, the ACA said that he was transphobic, uh, they, they denounced him, weren't going to have anything to do with him, and he replied to that. And there's a lot of atheists who will say that, on the one hand, no, atheism is just about the lack of evidence for the existence of God. But then they'll denounce other atheists for espousing views that they'll say are, are wrong, uh, views that you, you can't hold. You can't be a good atheist if you hold these views. Uh, this has happened with Richard Dawkins as well, that Dawkins has, has said things, uh, and things that are, that are awful. Uh, things that maybe maybe I would agree with, and even things that I wouldn't necessarily agree with. And atheists have uh, denounced him, say that he's misogynistic, that he's transphobic, uh, and say that they don't want to have anything to do with him, we're not going to have him at a conference, don't read his books. Sounds a lot like Christians, uh, where for these atheists, it's not just lack of belief in God, they're also enforcing a secular liberal ideology that you must hold to, and if you don't agree with it, there will be consequences for you, even things like a kind of secular excommunication. So they should be aware of that. If they try to ridicule Christians for doing that, a lot of atheists uh, do the do the same thing. Instead, we should all be free to put the best ideas out there and test them. All right, here is the last one, the last double standard. It's okay to criticize Christians, but it's not okay to criticize Muslims. This is the thing I've always found fascinating, that you'll read atheistic bloggers. They'll talk about how Christians want to take over this country. They want to uh, force people to abide by 
the Old Testament laws, and there would be all you know, think about Margaret Atwood's *The Handmaiden's Tale*. You know that if Christians somehow took over, they would enslave women and do all of these horrible things. And all of these examples live in their imaginations that they have not happened, and they're nowhere near happening. Uh, most Christians just don't want to be involved with evil. We don't want to be involved in a same-sex wedding. There's plenty of businesses that will be involved. We just don't want to be involved in that, or abortion, or pornography. Just leave us alone in that regard. Uh, so I've noticed that there'll be all this criticism about Christianity as if it's trying to take away everybody's rights, and then radio silence on Islam where actually the closest thing to The Handmaiden's Tale would be how women are treated in Muslim countries, where women cannot go outside without a, a male chaperone, aren't allowed to drive a car, aren't allowed to go to school. Even in very Christian subcultures in the United States, you don't have anything like that. Uh, and it's just amazing to me that there are atheists who will say Christianity is the greatest that threat to human rights, to women, and completely ignore Islam in that regard. There was a panel a few years ago at Georgetown University where he's a humanist, Phil Suckerman. Uh, he's not religious, a humanist. Uh, I don't know if he calls himself an atheist, but he is a humanist, believes in the value of human beings apart from God. Uh, it was with Kirsten Powers and I think Russell Moore, uh, who's a Christian. And he was talking, and they were talking about how, you know, people, atheists, will criticize Christians, but they won't criticize Islam. And in many re cases, the reason is that they're afraid to criticize Islam, because they know they could be threatened with violence, but they can criticize Christians all day long because Christians, except for a few radical examples, uh, Christians, by and large, are nonviolent uh, when, they, when people say incredibly offensive things to them. So here's the clip. I absolutely agree that uh, it is okay for uh, those on the left to critique, mock, deride Christianity, but oh, Islam gets, Islam gets a free pass, which is so strange, because if you care about women's rights, if you care about human rights, if you care about gay rights, uh, then you really uh, uh, Islam is much more, of a, more problematic. Uh, sorry to paint Islam with a huge brush. Uh, and much more devastating. As an atheist, where on planet Earth is the death penalty meted out to atheists? Right. It's it, only in, I think, 24 Muslim countries. Um, where have human rights flourished the most? In Christ Christian nations. Where is uh, a tolerance the greatest in, in nations rooted in Christianity? So uh, when I look, I see Christianity as a great friend to secular culture. Uh, and I see Islam as much more of a threat, much more debilitating, much more, not, I'm not talking about Muslim individuals that I happen to sit next right. to on an airplane or are my neighbors. I'm talking about uh, the doctrines and, the, and those with the power to enforce those doctrines in the form of Sharia law. So I agree with you. So the question you're asking though is, is why? why? Because, yeah. because, I mean, this was the Bill Maher, Ben Affleck, uh, mm -hmm. Sam Harris kerfuffle as well. Um, and I would say uh, two things. I know what keeps me uh, uh, from critiquing Islam on my blogs is just fear. I, I've got three kids, so mm -hmm. um, I know that I can say anything about Christianity or Mormonism, and I'm not living in fear, which is a testament to Christianity and Mormon. I mean, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. Thank you. That you, you're not gonna, <laughs> I can write on my blog all kinds <laughs> of things. Uh, if you'd like more on this subject, by the way, I definitely recommend Robert Wilkins' book, Liberty in the Things of God, The Christian Origins of Religious Freedom. And Wilkins does a great job of showing how Christianity has promoted the natural right to religious freedom since the time of the Apostles. In fact, it was the ecclesial writer Tertullian who first used the phrase freedom of religion, actually. So definitely go and uh, check that out. So to summarize the five double standards, we have the ancient document double standard. We have saying that God is evil, but also saying there's no such thing as evil. Uh, bad Christians are evidence against atheism, but bad atheists don't prove anything. Uh, ridiculing how Christians censor others. Uh, but uh, censoring and excommunicating other atheists you disagree with, and then criticizing Christians while not criticizing Islam for doing similar things or for actually engaging in human rights violations. So I hope that's helpful for you all, and yeah, I just hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.